You're about to move. I am about. And change your life. I'm about to, everything is about to change. In a lot of ways. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> Great question. What are you doing? <laughs> You've been there, I know, many times, All right, right? I'm going to get comfortable. Yeah. Um, what am I doing? Firstly, I decided that after I broke up with my boyfriend that I didn't need to be in Melbourne. I didn't have anything tying me down. Mm. And I have always had a soft spot for Byron. Like any time I could go away just for four or five days, it was like, I'm going to go to Byron. I'm going to surf and do yoga and just have some nature time and do my thing. Mm. So I thought, why not go and live up there? And then I can surf, do yoga, teach yoga. And that could be more of a lifestyle that I live every day. I remember when I met you, you were telling me, well, you, you were kind of doing it. You, you wanted to travel, teach yoga around the country, around the world. And it's not like that you still can't or don't or won't do that. But has this superseded that? I think it's going to feed the, like my sort of yearning to travel. And even though I'm going up there to move, I think I crave that like different environments, different stimulus. Um, you know, I love being in a, a warm climate and a different environment. And so I see Byron as, all right, that's going to be where I live, mm. but I can run the teacher trainings that I want to run, that I was going to run overseas. Like I was planning on going to Sri Lanka mm. and then COVID happened. Mm. And so there goes like the, yeah, the teacher trainings I was going to run overseas. So this feels like, all right, that plan didn't happen. So new plan. How about I move to a place where I might've run, like I've run one retreat in Byron. And how about I move to a place where I was running retreats and now that can be my home base. Right. What, what, what does it feel like? I, know, I haven't been. But you haven't I'm, been? No, I haven't been. You should totally go. We can come and visit. All right, I <laughs> yeah. will. But the, the, like, the feel, like Melbourne's, every city has its own feel and energy and like pace. Yeah. What is Byron? I, I have an idea of what it is. Yeah. I've been to Queensland before, but what does it feel like? So as soon as I get there and take my shoes off and land either on the beach mm. or wherever, like some sort of outdoor place, I just feel instantly like slow down mm. and calm down and just very like mellow. The pace definitely feels slower up there. And I think it's definitely changed. There's definitely the commercial side of like Byron, a lot of people moving up there, but there's still definitely that feeling of it's like everyone lives a lot of their time outdoors it feels slower it feels more mellow like i've been for a surf there like in the morning in the middle of the day in the evening and it's like it doesn't really matter what time pe that's what people are doing as their activities mm. we go to the yoga studio and it's like a full house because everyone seems to be living either like outdoor but like healthy active lifestyles um but the the surfing thing is rather than going to the gym like a lot of people in melbourne will go to the gym or they will go to a yoga studio or they'll go for a run or something but people will go for a surf as they I'll, I'll go to for a surf before i start work or after i finish work i go for a surf and so it's got this i think there's a lot of connection to nature and so it feels yeah it feels really calming and grounding and it also used to be an aboriginal meeting ground so, Byron Bay? Yeah, Byron oh. Bay. Um, so a lot of people see it as quite a healing place because they would come to Byron. I don't know sort of all the details, but I knew it was a meeting ground and there was maybe some sort of sacred rituals around that. But there's a lot of people that talk about like the healing qualities of Byron. And this makes sense to me on several levels. Ending a relationship, being called to go to Byron Bay mm -hmm. as maybe a like healing, nurturing time for myself as well as continuing doing what I love. So. When did you know, like when did you make the decision that you're like, all right, this is it. I'm, I'm flipping Good. the page. Good question. So before I broke up with my boyfriend, I went to Byron as like, Oh, this is um, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Let's get some clarity. Let's have some like me time. And I got up there and it just became pretty clear once I was up there what I needed to do. But as you do when you're in Byron, I went to an energy healer, a shamanic energy healer, 
and she said that we had this past life connection that was making us feel like we were tethered to each other and that's what the relationship felt like it felt like we were trying to make it work but it felt really stuck and like nothing was getting better it was progressively getting worse and so she said I'm going to clear this past life connection she said it was almost like we were married in the past and we'd made like a vow to each other and you may or may not like believe in this stuff but I, I certainly resonated with it because it felt like we were like trying and it was like that we were stuck and she said I'm going to clear this like sort of bound feeling that you have together and it's not to say you have to break up but it's to allow you to make this decision in this lifetime like do you want to be with this person or not so at the end of the session I felt like I think I know what I need to do mm. now and it was pretty clear and while I was in Byron I reached out to a friend that had bought a property up there and said hey I'm just putting the feelers out there are you renting out any rooms in your house that you've bought and the answer was yes and to three other women from Melbourne two of which I knew so it all felt very fitting look there's I'm a skeptical guy <laughs> but I'm a man of science but I'm also a man of I don't know what the hell was going on and I hear stories from people who see people like this healers or uh, what's, that, what's that other word there's a what are some other words? There's psychics, yep. there's mediums, yep. there's um, Reiki, yep. there is, what's the other one that I'm thinking of? Um, kinesiology. You put kinesiology in that team? Well, some people are like, they do like energy testing. So yes. it's like, because a lot of it's based around energy. Right. And so they're, they're either reading your energy, some people tap into like mediumship is getting information from other people. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I think there's something, you know, when you're driving or something and you're looking ahead, your focus is well ahead of you or you're walking and your focus is well ahead of you, but you look outside of your peripheral vision and someone's looking at you. Like, what is that? Like, there's something I think that connects us all that we haven't defined yet through uh, the, the scientific method or whatever you believe in. And through that line of thinking, I think, well, maybe, you know, maybe other people are tapped into things that I'm not or you're not. Yeah. Someone explained it really well to me once, and this is something that resonated with me, and I've had quite a lot of experiences with energy healers and mediums and all of that and a lot of what they've said to me has been pretty spot on including another person I just recently went to see mm. but it's like if everything is energy we are impacted by everyone's energy and like a really simple way to see it is like if someone walks into a room and they're in a really bad mood they're like heavy emotional and they're bringing all that like heavy emotion heavy energy into the room and you can instantly feel it without a word being said and, and have you experienced oh, of course yes yeah. and then vice versa someone's got like they're beaming like they're full of energy they're like it's like they're on fire and again no words could be spoken but you are aware of their energy like their positivity their light and without a word being said you can kind of pick up on their their vibe i guess and I think that's just said in a really simplified way, but I think part of like going into going to an energy healer, they're going to read your energy as, and then for some of them, they're reading a whole lot more. But mm. when people are telling you things that are like either no one else knows or they, all they know is your name. Yeah, it, that I hear. I hear yeah. stories like that. Yeah. And I'm not there. So mm. of course you don't know. Have you had the experiences like that? Yeah, just recently. Okay, tell me. So I went to a psychic uh, maybe a week or two ago, two weeks ago. How much did they charge? This was $170. For how? For an hour? Yeah. Mm, interesting. So, you know, this person's making good money. Um, I but... mean, it's interesting because... I'm sorry I interrupted you. But the market, capitalism, is this crazy, chaotic, beautiful thing because... You don't need 
you can make it in so many different ways. And wh mm. whether you agree with psychics or healers or not, the fact of the matter is you can make, I don't know how much doctors make, but uh, I'm sure it's ballpark around something like that. Um, but you can make more than degree mastered qualified people for something so different and what some people call so out there. And I just think that's, that's like, gives you hope because you can do really whatever you want in this life. Totally. And that for me, like now going off onto another tangent is what I think is like what we're here to do is find like what are our gifts? Like what are we called to do? Because it could be anything. It could be to be a psychic. It could be to be a coach in strength and conditioning, getting into nutrition. I've seen you talk about like a whole lot of health related topics these days. Mm. For me, I never planned on being a yoga teacher. I went and studied naturopathy. That's right. Yeah. And so I have a degree in natural medicine and health science, which has certainly helped me be a more informed yoga teacher. But I never planned on being a yoga teacher. And there's a lot of yoga te teachers who might not make a decent income because you don't get paid a huge amount. Mm -hmm. But if you have an area of interest or specialty or passion, you can turn that into whatever you like and you can make a healthy income that allows you to live a certain life. But it, it is like finding like, what is that thing that you're super excited about and passionate about? Otherwise, I know teachers that are like, oh, how much am I going to get paid? Or have you paid my invoice and all of that? It's like that's and, the first questions they ask. Yeah, right. and those teachers after having a studio uh, the teachers that I'm like, you're doing it for the money and I get it. Like we're going to pay your invoice and you're going to get paid for your teaching and I'm going to value you for your teaching and your services and your time and your energy. But if that is your first question, it probably is not driven by passion or the love for it or being inspired. It's probably, it sounds to me a little bit more money driven. And for me, I want to earn a healthy income and live the life I want to live, but money is secondary. It's like, I want to do what I love first and then money comes next. Mm. There's a, in, in like theory, yes, absolutely. That's so important. But I see so many people get stuck. Like so many people are living just means to an end. It's, and it's, I think that's okay as well. Like you can have this, for means to an end to make you money and you can have this pillar for something else, this pillar for fulfillment. Do you think that, is that a luxury that we get to live in like this Western modern society to actually do what we love instead of, you know, being born in like, I don't know, India or Uganda or any third world country and having just to survive? Totally. So I think we've been given a gift by being born in a country where there is opportunities. Yeah. So. On that note, I also feel like for me personally, I can't speak for anyone else, but like, I feel like, like I would be silly not to embrace this opportunity right. to Take do it. that. Take like, full advantage. I yeah. was in a relationship with a person who was doing a job that he hated, would hate getting up every day, would like be grinding through the day and it would leave him so unhappy that it rippled off into yeah. every other aspect of his life. But he has he had the ability to like, let's go and learn this or let's go and do an apprenticeship here or let's go and explore this. Like literally the world is your oyster. When you live in a country like we do in Australia, like you have so many options and like, why not go explore your passions or your skills or the things you're interested in? So for me personally, I feel like if I, and this is like, you know, partly a pressure I put in myself, but. I want to live to my fullest potential yes. and I want to explore opportunities. Like I feel like I have a passion to teach and educate and share that with other people. So if I'm sitting there and twiddling my thumbs and not doing it, I feel like I'm not living to my fullest potential. If I can help someone not have back pain or if I can give them the confidence to stand up in front of a room and speak to a group of people and become a yoga teacher, or if I can empower them to do a handstand and they never thought they could ever mm. do that. Like, I feel like it's my duty to do that. And it's, it certainly is a luxury because I've been given the opportunity to go and learn from people. It doesn't mean it wasn't hard work, but I certainly, 
like started in a better place than a lot of people. If I, you know, lived in a third world country, yeah. you have to like climb more mountains to, to get opportunities. But, you know, I think the best thing you can do with such a gift of an opportunity, like we or people in our situation living in countries or states like this is to take full advantage of it is to squeeze as much as you can out of that lemon and so you can but at the same time it's like at some like uh, it's like yeah the pursuit of constant growth that doesn't really stop unless you decide it stops tapping into your potential that is really never gets fully tapped into right no and i think if you're someone with a growth mindset i i personally believe this is like a forever long journey yeah. like i've gone and learned a lot about anatomy and the body and health but i feel like i know this much compared to like what is out there and so for me i want to keep learning like i've just signed up to a meditation teacher training in byron bay because mm. I've dabbled with meditation little bits, but I know that there's so much more and I'm also want to use this as a way to like get myself into like a, a dedicated meditation practice. So I'm like, I'm signing myself up to this to go and learn for myself so that then I can potentially pass this on to others and, and give back. And I think, I don't know if this is where you're going before, but we have more opportunities and we can keep learning and growing, but then there's going to be like different times where maybe we can give back and do charity work or have offerings for people who don't have, you know, the same financial means to do certain things or, you know, is it work with the homeless or like do different things to give back because there are other people that don't have the same opportunities. Absolutely. It's, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting this great Jay-Z lyric that it talked about this and he, he was like, something about here he had to get rich so then he could give that back to the poor because if he's poor he, he can't necessarily give back as much but at the same time sometimes when you have so little and you give like i mean that's that's a that's a very uh it's a trait our society and people generally admire a lot i know yeah but uh, that's one i struggle with mm. because i'm a survival guy i want to survive and conquer and if you, it's like you've got to teach yourself to be more giving, compassionate, empathetic. Uh, but it kind of, I don't know, it goes against this, this reptilian brain that I have to just, well, if I have more resources, I can grow maybe faster. Mm. And then once I'm at the point, I can give back and facilitate more uh, giving back in the future. But I don't know, is that just a trick I play on myself maybe? I don't know. I think we can all do it in different ways. Like my nan is a perfect example. She's recently passed away and she had a really great life, but she, you know, they moved from Sri Lanka to Australia and had not much, but she always had like her doors open to everyone, even though they didn't have much, she would feed like my dad's friends or whoever came in the door. There was always enough to like to pass on and share with others, even though they didn't have much themselves. And I think taking that idea of like, you know, even if we only have this much, then we can give our time, our energy. Yeah, there's other things we can give. Yeah. Um, That's true. And for me, when I teach, like not everyone agrees with this, but most of my classes run over time yeah, because same. I'm personally not bound by time. Some people don't agree with that because it's like, well, you're not respecting everyone's time and if people need to leave my class early, they yeah, need to leave my that. class. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. But I, there's more I want to give and so I don't see it as like, oh, I have to finish my class on time. Okay, our 60 minutes is up. It's more like, all right, I have more to give and I want to keep sharing until like I finish, until I feel like my offering for today is finished yeah. and I respect you if you need to leave, etc. But for me that's part of like the giving is like i will happily give more of my time because that's part of what i have to give um, i like the word you used offering it's like very it's a very like sacred uh kind of ritualistic word um you're offering i don't know did you use that word on purpose uh i that's what i see Probably just part of your language yeah i see teaching is an it's an offering it's being of service right it's, and 
if I, yeah, I'm, I'm not someone who feels like, okay, well, I'm on the clock and this is when I start, this is when I finish. It's, it feels like that's how I'm going to be of service not like, okay, that's, that's the end of the class. It's like, actually, I've still got more to give. I think that's one characteristic trait symptom of like, okay, do, am I doing the thing that, oh, what's the word? It's like, that resonates with my heart, soul, mind. Yeah. Like, am I doing the You're, thing? Are you on purpose? Are you living on, like, based on like your right. purpose? And you kind of forget about time. You're not counting the minutes. You get stuck in, you get lost in like the zone, like you're still talking about your sister. In the flow. In the flow, yeah. right? Basketball did that to me. Coaching does that to me. Um, podcasts, talking, videos, books, just self-development, teach all these things. It's like, mm. if you, I think that's a great sign that you're onto something. Mm. Yeah, because then you see it in the world where people are like, oh, I've got like three hours before I finish work or it's almost the weekend yeah. or it's, yay, it's Friday or, oh my God, it's Monday or all of that. And I'm like, I, I don't really get it because that's not how I feel with work. It's not like, oh my God, it's Friday. It's like, you know, when I'm teaching, even though some days like on a Saturday morning, it's harder to get out of bed. But, but when I'm teaching, I'm like, I'm yeah. so glad I'm here and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. And after I finished, I was like, well, that was amazing. Of course, I wanted to get out of bed for that. But it's not like, oh, God, I have to teach. It's, it's not that feeling. It's, it feels like I get the opportunity to do it. <sighs> That's it. I was reading, rereading and now analyzing, summarizing Atomic Habits. Have you read that book? No, but it's in the list of like <laughs> on Audible, the recommended, and then I've definitely heard it um, recommended on some podcasts, I feel like. I'm really impressed by how- So I need uh, to read it. Okay. Yeah, because every kind of winner or every like person who's doing great things in their life, I've mentioned this too, they're either reading it, read it, or about to. Shit, I better get onto it. No, I'm, I'm just, and yeah. <laughs> I haven't spent like, uh, I. I haven't spent, I haven't summarized and analyzed many books on my YouTube channel because they take a long ass time. Yeah. So I have to make sure this book is really resonates with me. Yeah. And that's one of them. And so the point I bring it up is because there was a, there's a self-talk reframing that James puts in there. And it's like, most people feel obliged to do things. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. It's like a new habit you're trying to form. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, I have to go exercise. I have to start meditating. And the reframe of what exactly what you said, you're already doing it, I get to. Mm. And if you replace have to with get to, and then on the back end of that, tell, tell yourself, well, I get to teach yoga uh, to people. I get to facilitate the teaching of a yoga teacher training to students, and then you put in what that gives you, or what mm. that does for you. And what, to, like, I get to train every day and give myself a burst of energy and continue to uh, pursue the excellence that I'm trying to pursue through my health, vitality, wellness, and physical presence, like whatever it is. Mm. And so I think that's a huge like self-talk reframe perspective. Yeah. Like I've definitely had moments where, and one in particular that stands out and there's probably several if I reflect on it, but I was, running a teacher training and I had probably like five really close friends that were in this teacher training that I was running at my studio in Elwood and I had to like pinch myself because I was like I get to do this like how cool is it that I am here on my weekends like we were there like Friday night Saturday Sunday hanging out together and I'm teaching yoga but I'm really hanging out with my friends and a group of people that I genuinely like and that I want to spend my time with and this is called work right but I it doesn't feel like work it was like I I get to do this so I almost feel like grateful that I got that opportunity and I get those opportunities to do that because it's not like I have to do it. It's I want to do it. And it's, it's more like, is this for real? <laughs> and not all areas of my life are like that. Like for example, meditation, I feel like I probably should meditate more. And so I'd like to take that, the same thing that I have with uh, teaching 
that I, I get to do that. I get to meditate yeah. because X, Y, Z. Yeah, like I love to move my body and I, I, I appreciate that and I get to move my body. That's how I feel about movement of most sorts, whether it's surfing, yoga, gymnastics, handstands, weight training, whatever. Like I have a similar like connection with that. But yeah, with something like meditating, which is why I'm signing myself up to this course so I can maybe appreciate it as well, like learn more because I like similar to you I like to I want to understand the science but then I want to like feel the benefits of the practice so then I get to the other side where I can then say I get to do this because I've gone through and I I like to understand the why so I think I know a little bit about the why but I feel like it's diving deeper that's going to then give me more of that that'll feel hopefully like it does for teaching yeah it'll give you different techniques a greater respect understanding gratitude ideas like you're diving into the field deeper to spark your curiosity further um if we go back you were talking about have you read the alchemist by paulo coelho i have at the at the time that i read it I don't think that it landed for me and this was years ago and I kind of put it down to I just don't think it was like right headspace right time and so I had all these people recommend it and I was like I don't know what these people are talking about Um, yeah it just didn't land but I would like to go back and read it because I feel like now I'd probably have a different appreciation and different life experiences how long ago was it I'm going to say like four or five years okay. ago. Okay, not that long. Six, maybe six years ago. It was a little while ago. Okay. Yeah. But the term, like you say, you used a couple of words earlier. You're like purpose, a calling, offer, like these were different words you use for like finding that thing. Uh, Coelho, he uses the word personal legend. Do you remember that, him using it in the book? Uh, possibly. Yeah, I, I think so. I think maybe I just maybe hadn't at the time didn't resonate with the language around. Right. So I actually was like, what is he getting getting at and I wasn't so I think actually it was even longer than that I think it was before I started teaching yoga uh-huh. and so maybe I was not yeah I hadn't found my purpose and passion so but you're probably a very different person now yeah I imagine yeah. are you yes definitely my whole life changed once I did my yoga teach training I left the job that wasn't fulfilling me and you know changed my whole lifestyle changed I think that's the thing, like finding your personal legend, which is this kind of ultimate calling and purpose in life, which is what he tells with the story of Santiago, who goes to find treasure, and then you'll see if you read it. Yeah, I need um, to go back now. <laughs> but it's, I like this phrase a lot, personal legend, but I also think that it's in some ways a luxury to, like I said before, to experience it because there might be people listening and watching who are just stuck in the minutiae of life ever since they're a kid. They just had really poor environment, poor upbringing, abusive trauma, whatever. And there's billions of people out there and a lot of them are like really stuck. They don't find this thing or they don't find it until way later in life. And I'm really interested in this idea of like, I'm really curious about child development and, and even like in utero health, pregnancy, um, like how do we set up, no one chooses to be born, but how do we set up the next generation, the next child, the next human, so they can live out their potential and personal legend. And I don't really, I don't really know I think where to begin sometimes. I think there's like so much that can impact. Yeah us like especially in childhood they say the first seven years is when really you're like programming your yourself or you're being programmed through like your parents your environment Mm -hmm. everything that is having an impact on you it's usually like zero to seven is going to be where the greatest impact is but like bringing ourselves to like current moments like not everyone not everyone's purpose is going to be to have like a million YouTube followers or to make a million dollars or to have like for me to have a um, a yoga empire let's say like for some people it could be to bring a child into this world or it could be to help 
um, you know, like give back to the community in some way. For some people it could be. So I think also like we have this idea that it's, well, society does anyway, I don't really subscribe to this, but like um, buy the house, earn the money, get married, have kids. What else is there? What comes next? <laughs> yeah. All of like have a certain amount of money in the bank, yeah, all yeah. of that. And so success is seen as this, this and this. Like after breaking up with my ex, I've been listening to a lot of relationship podcasts and everything is sort of like, if you're not in a relationship, then like- You've got to be looking for one, Yeah, right? like, yeah. So it's either got to be looking for one or why aren't you married? Or like, why haven't you got kids? And so like marriage is seen as almost like a success. The same thing with like our jobs and careers or well, how much money do you earn? But everyone is going to have like a different- thing that would be like them living like on purpose Mm. it might not look like what everyone else is doing so i think also like reframing it for people to find out like what are you really interested in what what excites you what fills up your cup what like what makes you feel more energetic what makes you feel tired and depleted like so because it could be like simple things it could be like going out into nature and planting trees, but it might not look like having a lot of money in the bank or having a fancy car. And so I think for some people, it is also like a reframing of like, what is success or what is like you living a life that's on purpose? It might not be like what you and I think of is like purposeful. And so I think there's some people and you know certainly a few people that i can think of in my head is like they're they're kind of chasing that like what is success but they're not happy like they have you know a six-figure salary they've got a car they've got a house but they're still not happy so these are people that do have the opportunities but they're actually like chasing someone else's dream right the dream that you get sold and programmed to from a young age yeah and so what i get excited by is like you know like helping people break that model Mm. that it isn't that like that is success like what what fills you up like what what is something that makes you feel excited make gives you energy i think for me that's like a big thing it's like if there's something that makes me feel like tired depleted like oh i can't be bothered like i'm probably not supposed to be spending my time and energy doing that but if there's something else that makes me forget the time and I walk away and I feel better than when I walked in and then that feels like I should be doing more of that. And so maybe it's even less about knowing like, I know what I wanna do, but just do more of like the things that make you feel better, make you feel more energetic, make you feel more happy, make you feel more fulfilled. Um, And they don't have to be this grandiose, huge thing. Yeah superficial thing yeah like it can be really simple it can be it can be whatever you want Mm. which is really the beautiful thing is that you you can design the life that you want we know unlimited many types of people who make great lives for themselves from very little Mm. which gives you a lot of hope that it is possible Uh, but i think it's interesting when i was younger i was more like that i was like I, I wanted a lot. <laughs> the money, I had a the fancy I, car. The... Amelia, I, I've said this maybe once, or maybe twice uh, publicly, but like when I was a kid, I had a scrapbook. And I would, you know, you got magazines, and we get these catalog magazines because it's junk mail. And I'd cut it, look through it like that. See? And I said, I like that car. I'd cut it out put it in the scrapbook the house that was being you, sold you were doing the vision boarding at a young age oh that's what i did i didn't even re- oh that is <laughs> yeah that's you essentially your own, yeah uh, did, didn't even know that was a, the phrase back then obviously but and i was making my own scrapbook of the things that i really liked and wanted and most of the things i was like designing the house the car the lifestyle blah, 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 and most of it was quite superficial i just thought i wanted these things for whatever reason and now as i age and whatever you call this maturing if you call it that um sure we'll call yeah. it that whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. i have realized like i love like yeah i do really love cars and i can appreciate really nice things but i actually don't like lust after them or really 
feel like I need them, like I, the younger version of myself does. And so I feel like I've been unburdened by this because all of those things require a certain amount of capital. Yeah. And to get that capital and financial monetary value to exchange those for those goods, you need to do certain things in this society, exchange goods and services to make a currency to then exchange more goods and services. And if your uh, lifestyle is less expensive and lower, then suddenly you don't need to kill yourself as much to live the lifestyle you want. Mm. And so you can, I could learn, you can live it sooner. Like I can live a life of fulfillment, peace, excellence, personal, my, chasing my personal legend. Oh, and I don't need a million dollars. That's how I feel now. Mm. Well, I'm sure it'd be nice to have a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk when that happens, maybe. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I'm certainly not the expert on this, but I um, think it was during lockdown, I started looking into a thing called human design. Have mm. you? Mm-mm. But, and I, I'm not going to speak too much because I'm not the expert, but it does kind of look at your, it looks at many things and this is kind of going back down like the woo woo pathway, but it does look at um, like astrology. Uh, there's like a science element and I'm not, can't think of now the science. It's not, it's not physics or quantum, maybe it's quantum physics. So there is a science element. So there's like astrology, quantum physics, um, some sort of like energy, I think they call it Kabbalah. It's like an energy system, chakras, and then something else. But anyway, it sort of combines kind of all of these elements together, but it's saying that there is a certain way that you're going to like thrive in your life. Uh And so like an example could be that um, this person, let's say they have this human design, are probably going to thrive as an entrepreneur because they're something in their human design will tell them that they're they're not great at taking like orders from certain people and and et cetera, et cetera. Or they've got the the ideas and they they're the ones to like birth the ideas out into the world. Um, but I. I did my human design and I came up as a manifesting generator, but where supposedly like people that like to have like several different things going on I love and that. yeah. And also they tend to be entre- entrepreneurial people cause they're like, okay, and I've got this idea and I want to turn this into something. But I think it's a, a really fascinating thing that might give people a bit of a guide in terms of like, maybe I'm trying to do this and things feel like forced and hard and like I'm trying to like push shit up hill to like make this happen. But maybe it's almost like done in the way that doesn't really agree with how you work as a person. Your character. Yeah. Yeah. It's like how you see some people thrive in certain environments and you're like, that feels like it fits for Mm -hmm. them. Um, But yeah, it was interesting when I did mine because I can see why I've, landed in a place where I run my own business and I work for myself. And certainly when I go into studios, I work for other people, but there's big parts of my business where I'm, I'm the leader. I'm, you know, running my online classes or teacher trainings and all of that. And it it was just very fitting when I did my human design because it's like, oh, that makes sense why I have gravitated towards doing that. So a bit of I guess, affirmation or confirmation mm. that you're on the, the right path. Yeah, that's, that's what it feels like. But I think for some people, it could be also an eye opener of actually, that's probably why this isn't working. So for me, it felt like a confirmation. And certainly I think there's area, other areas I could explore in terms of like, oh, okay, maybe that's why that bit doesn't work or that's why I should maybe put more energy into something else. Um, mm. And for some people, it could be, to direct them in a slightly different direction. And that reminds me of uh, this Japanese term, I'm gonna say, you know, it starts with an I? Yeah. Ikigaya. Uh, ikigai. Iki, iki, ikigaya. Ikigaya. Yeah. yeah. You've seen it, you've seen the diagram. Yeah. I really I'm, love I'm, it. I'm reading a book about it. You, it's called Ikigai? Ikigaya? Well, this one is, um, 
I don't know whether it's Ikigai or the practice or it's essentially t um, telling you how to find your Ikigai and it also talks about the, I could be saying it wrong as well, the Shinkansen um, mentality or I'm, or I'm just going to call it the bullet, bullet train mentality which is essentially like when someone had the idea of the bullet train everyone was like that's no one's ever going to be able to do that but their view is that like you need to have an idea that is like way out there like 10 times or 100 times what we can currently do because that's how you achieve excellence mm. essentially is like go and jump over here and then find all the people that can help you create the bullet train because the bullet train is like not something that you see around the world except for japan because they've gone and like thought you know, a hundred steps further forward than everyone else. So the Ikigai is one thing and then their their bullet train sort of mentality is how they like to approach everything. Yeah, it's like, it reminds me of what Tim Ferriss uh, said in his book, Tools of Titans. He asked the question of, or someone asked the question of, you got things you want to achieve, I got things I want to achieve, okay. Maybe that's a five year, 10 year, three year, whatever. Okay, uh, gun to your head, okay. You have to achieve this in six months. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna do it? And once you, if you really think about it and you really reflect on it, and I did this, this practice once with some things that I'm, I'm trying to work on, like you come up with some interesting things and you realize that maybe the thing that you're trying to go after doesn't need to take as long as you think. Mm. And you can get after a bullet train style. Yeah. I actually had an ex-boyfriend say that to me. It was like, let's look at like 10 year goals. And he said to me, he's like, why can't you do that in one year? Right. And I, Keep talking. Because I, I had um, a goal of like, I want to run an international teacher training in 10 years because I saw that as like such a big, like far over here goal. And as soon as he said that to me, I was like, well, of course. Like, why does yourself. It, yeah, why does it have to be 10 years? Arbitrary why, number. Yeah, why can't it be next year? Like, what's stopping me from running an international teacher training in a year or two years? And I, you know, I have run my first international teacher training, but it, it took a switch of mindset because I saw it as, oh, like, that's too big or that's too, like, that's going to take more time. Um, so, yeah. It was less of the gun to the head, but more just flipping the mentality, but same idea. Oh yeah. Uh, I think then you can, you really start to be able to achieve and do more of the things you want to do in life without the arbitrary, like this has to take a long time. It's like maybe for the average person, but I mean, is that what you want to be? Is that who you're trying to be? Probably not. So there are people who have done it. Like I think we can look at, there's certain models in, in like society we can look at, like people who have done it quicker, differently, they've innovated, they use strategies like the, the bullet train strategy and there's things to be learned there and emulated and mimicked. Mm. I think the, the Ikigai thing, which I totally jumped over to the bullet train is, is something that um, that's the thing. I love that so much. Yeah. I, I can't remember like all the elements, but it's something like where you're like purpose, passion, yep. skill and fulfillment. Yeah. Uh, there's a monetary component. Yeah. It's like all of them like meet up and like where in the middle is yep. like your, your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And th th it, throughout my life, I found so many different kind of uh, philosophical, psychological models, whether it's personal legend or whether it's Ikigaya for this thing mm. and when people because i teach young students right and a lot of them they don't that they're in this like uh, very malleable phase teenagers or well, late teenagers yeah young adults early 20s who are but it, i don't even mean like by chronological age i'm talking like mentally, like psychologically, uh, they've been stuck. They haven't found that thing. And uh, for a lot of people and, and young people, like if I had a kid, like, and they came to me and they asked like, I don't know what to do in this life. Like, I feel stuck. I feel um, confused. 
like what am I good at? <laughs> I have all these like doubts. Like I would point them in that direction. Like what makes you curious? What do you think about in your spare time? What do you do in your spare time? Where do you get lost with time? And I would ask these questions and you'd look at Ikigaya. And I think part of the answer of like in this crazy, chaotic, modern society, what do I do with my life is in that model. Mm. I saw a quote not so long ago and I'm not going to get the quote right, but essentially it was saying our life purpose is to find our life purpose oh, yeah. or the, the goal of life is to What's find the meaning of life uh not meaning i don't think it was the meaning but i think it was like either the goal of life is to find your life purpose essentially it was sort of like so in other words saying that for some people it might be that you find it tomorrow but for some people it might be that maybe you're 50 or maybe you're 60 or maybe you're 30 or maybe you're 20 but sort of like that's what life's goal is, is to find your purpose. And I think there's many people that would disappear off this earth without finding their purpose. But I really liked the fact that it was like, your goal is to seek out your, your life purpose. It's like, that's what you're here to do is to find what you're here to do. I, um, this makes me think, uh, cause I think all of this is like constructed. All of these things that we dedicate our lives to, like it's all just, what Yuval Noah Harari, he talks about imagined realities. All of this? It's, it's just a... It's just um, a fabricated. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you got something to say, no, like another word for say, it? No, I like someone, I've heard it being called, it's all just an illusion. Like what we're seeing, what we're experiencing is, is like an illusion. I think it's an illusion of a projection of our own like manifestation of like what we want to do in the world. Yeah. Is some way to say it. Because 100, 200... Let's back up like the last because I'm rereading Sapiens and it does a human history of mankind to give the subtitle. And it talks about how we got here. But this is this is a sliver. This last 100, 200 years, the Industrial Revolution is a tiny sliver in what was, Mm. you know, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. And particularly in the last uh, five to 15,000 years of being hunter gatherers. Um. What was our purpose? Oh, they didn't think about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was no. it was just, very different. Just survival. Yeah, procreation, yeah. Com- very community, tribe orientated. Like you wouldn't see groups of humans together pretty much in more than a hundred. But I also, this just popped into my head. I also think there was like the tribe, like medicine woman, medicine man, or totally, like yeah. there was like a role like I'm sure there was a lot of like just survive and like shelter food. No, water, but that's sex. the next layer. Yeah. There are roles within that. Yeah. But then there was like the, the mother archetype or the, the medicine woman, medicine man, or the person that was probably good with like building things and making things. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so it, I think I, who knows? I'm just like, like theorizing like that. I'm sure there was that, but in a very different way. I imagine, I imagine it would be more rudimentary. It would be like you'd have these main, like everything would be, no, I don't think everything would be geared towards survival because they're like plant medicine and like they would use plants and mushrooms and elixirs. They would create elixirs, like not just for medicine and healing, but I mean, there seems to be some anthropological evidence that people have used plants for other purposes, maybe psychedelic purposes, other than healing or medicine. And I'm trying to remember from some of the people I've listened to and watched and read. uh, I recently heard that like ayahuasca, that a lot of people are going and seeking out, doing for their own personal healing, that originally it started as like the the elder or the medicine woman or medicine man, whoever like led the ceremony would be the one that would take it. And they'd facilitate the healing via them taking it. And then they tapped into higher levels of consciousness and helped the healing of the other person via taking it themselves. But now like Western society and like the modern approach is like, no, like, we want to take it ourselves because we want to experience that 
Um, but it was yeah interesting watching a documentary that it was maybe facilitated in a different way because hmm. they were the one that were like facilitating the healing rather than giving it to other people. Right. And that that's a different dynamic, mm. you know. I haven't had experience with those compounds, yeah. but only hearing people talk about them and how transformative they can be, definitely more open to the idea of them. But to go back, yeah, there was these archetypal models. It's like you have elders, you have like, it's like it was very clearly matriarchal, patriarchal. Um, actually, I read this, something that sticks out to me is that not everybody, some tribes would believe, and I can't remember which one, but some tribes would believe that, well, a child was born not of the seed of one man, but of multiple men. And so women would sleep with as many men as she wanted to. Uh, she would sleep with the man who was really compassionate, empathetic, and a good lover. She would sleep with the man who- To get the qualities of all of them. Of all of them, of yeah. the, the really strong masculine, and all of them, because they believed that well, the child is made up of many. Yeah. And so under this presumption, then the child will be brought up amongst not one parent, yeah. but a, a whole community. Yeah. Which is quite different to the model that we have now, which is you have a child and you have a mother and father and, and that's it. And uh, I really am being attracted to the idea of it takes a tribe to raise a family or a child. Mm. Um, because I see parents do it by themselves and I can see it can be very difficult. But if you look back just a little bit behind you, mm. it seems like we've done it differently. And even certainly for children, but even for like everyone, like in terms of like, because I've spent a lot of time um, listening to relationship podcasts, that's where like my brain goes a lot at the moment. Yeah. But even they say that in a relationship that like we might want like this person to give us everything, to give us like the intellectual stimulation, uh, the physical stimulation, yes. the sexual stimulation, the like we can chat about our emotions, we can have conversations about work, we can like they can be the everything. That's what we want from our partner and, and vice versa from this one person. What do you think of that? And like... In theory, that sounds great. Like one person like serves all of those things. That sounds great. But really like it's like we would previously get that from a tribe of people that maybe mm. your partner is able to meet a lot of your needs, but maybe that sort of intellectual stimulation is from a friend or is from a coworker or is from something else or it, like the person who's interested in a similar activity, it doesn't necessarily have to be your partner but maybe that is from someone in your tribe that maybe the person you're with doesn't need to tick like all these boxes because we are like we're tribal beings we are that's sort of how it all started as you were saying and but now we're like looking to like one person to bring all of these things to our lives firstly that is a lot of pressure on that person both on the receiving and giving side of that um, because like a monogamous relationship, it is like, okay, well this person, I'm seeking out this person to tick all of these boxes, but maybe it's that we need to see our friends are gonna bring certain elements, our family is gonna bring certain elements, our, you know, our hobbies or, or whatever it is. And I think it's just an interesting like view to take because we've kind of now looked at it as like this, like my partner needs to be this everything for them to be the right fit. And I think you need to line up values and you need to make sure that you're on the similar page if you do want to have a monogamous relationship with one person. But maybe seeing like the tribe of people that you want to spend your time with, you want to give your energy to is also bringing many things to the table and that maybe it's not just this one person that has to like tick all of these boxes. Did you, I resonate with this deeply. Did yeah. you feel, is this something you've always logically understood or something that you have probably made the mistake of or neither? Um, I think it's just become something that's been 
almost like illuminated now. Right. Like I think from listening to lots of podcasts, going through, you know, a few long-term relationships and maybe in a previous long-term relationship feeling like this person does need to tick all of those boxes. And then in the past relationship, maybe thinking our values lined up and they didn't quite. So that was kind of just like a bit of a, a mismatch. It didn't really line up how was initially um, presented. But I think it now has just become more of a conscious idea of like, don't expect that person to be everything and you're not gonna be that everything to that person as well. That's so important. Because, uh, this is the trap that I used to think early mm. on is that you ha- you're you sold this idea of, you know, the, the I don't know what Hollywood calls it, but I can't remember, the, the, the perfect match. Like, like, oh yeah, that's what people call it, the soulmate. Yeah, yeah. And maybe some people find it by like some beautiful serendipitous luck and magic in this world, you find it. But at the same time, I don't, th- I don't know if you need to sacrifice every relationship that you have in the pursuit of that, in the pursuit of the dream of that, Mm. the lust of that, because maybe it's enough. Maybe, like you said, the person doesn't have to tick every box and you can unburden yourself and honor what that person brings you and value and realize that exactly that, that there are, what do we have friends, family, peers mm. for? Like, I've realized that, that I don't need my girlfriend to tick all of these boxes. Like, what a pressure. Yeah, because like maybe there's conversations you have with her that you wouldn't have with other people, but maybe there's other conversations you're like, I'll save that to someone in at the gym or I'll save that to someone that I work with or yeah. I used to, I used to unfairly judge my relationship and her because she wasn't meeting the standards on the boxes that were valuable to me. Though at the same time, she had all these other beautiful qualities, but you know, I think it's very individual. Like, is that worth it to you? Mm. And the characteristics and qualities that uh, maybe I was needing, I just had this moment. I'm like, wait, she doesn't need to be this whole person. Mm. She doesn't need to be everything. Mm. And at the same time, maybe it's not a good idea for the, for that person to be everything. Because if they're everything, you can become very reliant on that person. Mm. You only see one view back and forth. And you can distance yourself from the rest of the world around you. Yeah. You sort of become in this like codependent yeah. relationship and you don't see your friends or you don't see your family or you don't go and do certain activities anymore because you're like, oh, like we have a great time. Yeah. Like we get We're what all we, we need. need. Yeah. But you're not. Yeah. I don't think so. No, I think, and that's like the beauty of like different friendships, like bring different things, different interactions, bring different things, different experiences and Yeah, I think it's something that probably in the last couple of years has become more relevant to me because I think I watched a lot of movies when I was growing up that definitely like painted the picture of this is like what the perfect relationship looks like or this is like the happy couple or and it it was definitely like that you do find your soulmate or it's love at first sight or all of those things like the fairy tales and et cetera. And like, you know, I definitely had that idea of like, you know, that person is going to tick all of those boxes. And it kind of, you know, in one sense sounds like kind of crazy. Well, of, of course they're not, we're all human as well. And like we're multifaceted beings, but doesn't mean when we're going to meet everyone's needs or our partner's needs a hundred percent. That's okay. Yeah, and I that, think that's that, yeah, okay. and that and that is okay. I think that's that is the big thing. Because people think it's not okay. Yeah, and they just have to find that person. Yeah, and then I don't know where they are. Yeah, <laughs> you got to give me like ten lifetimes. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's like eight billion people here. Yeah, oh, okay, half of them probably are compatible, <laughs> gender wise. But dang, it's. I think there's core values. Yeah, and I I think that's the the biggest thing: core values. And if your values don't line up, you're probably not going to want 
similar things or a similar lifestyle. Um, I think also as much as core values, like a like similar visions and they don't need to be the same vision, but are they heading like in a similar direction? For like your life together? Yeah. So like maybe you don't want a kid and you want a kid, stuff like that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for example, with the previous ex, not the last one, um, he said, let's like write down 20 things that we want to do in our life. And I was like, I love doing shit like this. So I was like, that's a great idea. Let's write both write 20 things down that we want to do in our life. And this was just before I was about to go traveling overseas to do a yoga teacher training. And so we sat down, he wrote down his 20 things. I wrote down my 20 things and we had them on a whiteboard. And then once we finished, we're like, oh, let's like have a look at each other's. Mine had, I want to travel around the world. I want to teach yoga. I want to live in another country for a year. I want to keep learning. I can't remember all the other 20 things, but it was very like, it was a lot about teaching, a lot about travel, a lot about new experiences, learning, all of that. His was, I want to live on a farm. I want to have an animal sanctuary. I want to have a gym, et cetera, et cetera. And it was just, it just was a moment of things clicking for me. And I was like, we actually want very different things. And I think it's great to have your own goals and visions, but he wants to live in the country. Like the lifestyle yeah, would yeah. merge. Yeah, the lifestyles were like going in different directions. He wants to have an animal sanctuary in the country. I want to travel around the world and teach yoga. Like yeah. those things are, are kind of over here. Yeah. Um, and Is so, that a moment in the relationship you realized and then? Yeah, so then I went, over yeah, I, I went to Italy did a teacher training and we broke up not long after I came back because it, it literally was a pivotal moment wow. um, and I was like umming and ahhing do I want to have kids and I, I I don't even think I can't remember whether I wrote that down or not I wanted to get married but I didn't necessarily write to him um, but it was it was an interesting moment mainly because of like our visions were in opposite directions we and I, I think it's really important to have your own goals, but if one's to like be over here and one's to be over here, I don't see that as like visions that align. Yeah. So yes, it was a pivotal moment and something that I would say would be helpful to do earlier on in a relationship. And I think it's going to evolve and change. Yeah. It might be something you want to do every year and be like, Hey, what's your vision it's for like you're, your life? You're re-auditing your relationship. Mm. Which is probably a good idea. As you re-audit your relationship, but also your own life and yes. be like, like, what is my goal and what is my vision? And like, does yours, like, do our visions line up? <laughs> it's so important. It's like that, uh, what I've realized is that I'm just gonna... con constant, can you say it? Yeah. Cool. Just that constant communication um regardless of what time is it yeah 8 20 yeah the constant communication of expectations values uh through the different stages of relationship like not leaving the conversation about like marriage or family and children and and those lifestyle stuff until multiple multiple years in because by the time you get to that stage and then you plop the kid out suddenly you might realize like I, I know people like they realize like when they've committed to a child and then this is really like awkward but strange moment of like damn well yeah like we want we want different things in our life and then we're tied down or anchored down by this thing we created this human mm. life that you want to be there for so be careful. <laughs> yeah. So many lessons I've learned over the last couple of years and a lot just from my recent breakup three months ago. What about the last year? Like 2020, I think I, I've asked this question quite a few times to people. Um, what does the last year and a half teach Amelia and, and, and illuminate to Amelia about herself? and life um the biggest things that stood out is um what i resisted 
previous to COVID and lockdown was what I had to put my time and energy into during lockdown and, and COVID. So um, as you know, and I, well, at least I think you know a little bit about this, like I, I didn't have a huge love for like technology and wanting to do many things related to technology. Hence why you helped me at the start with like filming my yoga videos and getting me set up with all the things related to that, including um, uploading things onto an online platform because all of that just seemed like too hard, too much, like almost too much of my energy. I was like, I just can't. And so I resisted it so much that I put it in the like too hard basket. Then when we went into lockdown and I couldn't teach physical classes, firstly, I was like, thank God I had a four vision of like, I'm shutting my yoga studio, so I should film God, a lot of what classes. Good timing. Like what the hell? Damn. So I filmed, I think there was like 54 classes I had filmed after I shut my studio and then lockdown happened and I was like, cool, now I've got to get my act together and get all of these classes uploaded onto an o online platform. And my boyfriend at the time was really helpful with like getting me like set up with the, the online platform and helping me with the things that I resisted was like, how do I like do all the stuff at the back end and how do I then make it usable for people or students that are going to use this platform? So he initially helped me. And then after that first initial like setting it up, I realized it's actually not that hard. It was actually quite simple. And once I got my head around it, once I stopped resisting it, I was like, oh, this is easy. It's just like this, 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 upload the videos. And it became more simple once I stopped like resisting it and fighting it. Most of your friction was just in, in you were suffering in thought. Yeah, totally. I was, like, yeah, I was like, oh, I just don't know. And it's, it, it was new, it was new, it was unfamiliar. And the idea of like technology being like not a language that I spoke, it was more like, this is just, I, I put I put it in the too hard basket. And so it was mostly up here. Because you identified as a person who... I'm not great with technology. Yeah, so it's, it's already like a, it's already a label that I've given myself. And that's already starting on an uphill. Yeah. So once I got over that, I was like, this is actually amazing. And now I have these yoga videos that I can share with the world when people are stuck at home and they need to keep moving, looking after their body, do yoga, like whatever it is. When like the yoga studios are taken away, the gyms are taken away, eventually we had a five kilometer radius, all of those things. But it meant that I was still able to share what I had spent hours filming um, with people and it became a resource for them to help with their mental health, their physical health, give them some time out from sitting at their desk from you know being stuck at home where everything became just like this very isolated experience so i think the biggest lesson for me was like don't don't resist it until you've given it some time and energy to actually go like how about i learn or how about i get someone to help me and i think that was sometimes the things that i i didn't always reach out for help to do things so then i just put it as like too hard or I'm not going to do it. So I sat on those videos for six months. I didn't do anything with them until lockdown. And then there was you like, forced to do yeah, something. I was forced to do something. But what I now can appreciate is that I'm so thankful for like online and the ability to teach yoga online through like the on demand platform and then live stream that became as much for my students as it was for me. That was like my saving grace. It meant that I didn't go crazy because I was still able to see people every day. It was like a little community of people when we were doing live stream and for a lot of people, and I got messages from people or they even said, they're like, this is what's helping them get through as well. So it felt like this really nice exchange of like, I was able to continue to share and do what I love. So I felt grateful that I could do that. And then on the other end, they're like, this is helping me physically, mentally, energetically get through this period of time that is stressful and sucks and I'm at home and all of these things. So I 
yeah, was, I would have to say it's like what I learned most about was, was technology and <laughs> to not resist something until I've actually mm -hmm. given it some time and energy because it actually became like my greatest resource. What do you think, this is interesting, what do you think you're resisting now, whether you realize it or not, that could be equally valuable to like that was? Um, diving into, uh, diving into like the marketing and um, selling yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like diving into marketing, selling myself and like, how do I take what I've done, which, you know, has now been a few things, but how can I like up level that? How could I share it to more people? How could I be of service to more people? But I think I'm at the point of, again, I need to now seek people out to get help. Yeah, for sure. Um, because I'm not the expert in it, but I, I feel like I'm at a stage like, all right, go get help with these things that you're resisting, similar to what I had initially with the technology. So I'm telling myself what I need to do so that I can then go to the next stage of like evolving the initial offering that I have and adding more to it. So I've got to, not got to, I'm, I have the opportunity now in to. Byron, I get to go and film more classes because I'm going to have the space and time and energy to do that. Um, so that I can keep sharing and doing more. Mm. But there, there is certainly the part of I need to seek out some assistance and of course. support. Like that's, yeah. that's why we have, like people go to you, Amelia, to help them with their health, wellness, yoga teaching, classes, yeah. well, well-being. Mm. They don't, they don't, they're not solving the problem for themselves, they're going to you to help them. Yeah. You need to do the same thing with other people. Yeah. It's like in domains that you want to work on. I mean, mm. that's, but it, it makes me think, and it's another example in Sapiens, that we're a very compartmentalized society. We have thousands of professions of specialty professions. And we have mostly a, a society of people who are very good at one, maybe two things. Mm. And if left on their own to just tick the basic boxes of human capabilities, we probably wouldn't do a very good job. Like, mm. I don't know how to build a barn out of wood and chop trees. And even like, how many people know how to start a fire? I think it comes back to the tribe and actually like reaching out to people that become part of your tribe that are the people with those skills or yeah. with that support and and for someone who's quite independent and thinks I can do this I've got this I've got it all covered but I then I also know where my gaps are I know that like the marketing side and like the sales side I don't even like to see it as that but mm. like even like logistically with like the back end of a lot of things. I know that that's not currently my, my skill set or my strength. And so I know that there's areas that I need support, but sometimes I don't naturally like want to reach out to all these people to get the support. But I, th I think that's the, the a big thing for a lot of people is not trying to take it all on yourself because there's only so much time and energy you have and you might be better off putting your energy into something, and I'm saying this out loud, but it's really, I'm saying it to myself and for anyone else who needs to hear this, is that, yeah, there are other people out there with those skills that can help you. And I think I, not I think, I know I learned a lot from you with this is like, I knew the filming wasn't my area of expertise. So I got a lot of help from you at the start of like, you know, you you took that part and like that this is my responsibility of like I'm going to help you with this part and and I really appreciated that because it meant that I could do the part that yeah that you great was, yeah it was my skill right. and it was like awesome I've got someone that I I trust and respect and has great work ethic and integrity and so I I just let like you just did your thing and I didn't need to worry like you how are you going to yeah are you going to do a good enough job or are you going to have it executed in a certain amount of time because of your work ethic and integrity and and skill, I, I didn't need to worry about any of that. 
I think my thing is sometimes it's hard to find those people or to know where to find those people that feels like a good like alignment to work with mm. because there mm. there are lots of people who do marketing or advertising or email like all, all these different things so then it's for me probably where I get I probably hold back a little is like how do you find that those right people I'm, I was thinking of that answer and I think if you know at least one person who has those skill sets for example you describe me like that which I appreciate it's true. Ask, thank you. Ask, you have many people in your life like that. Yeah. Ask those people. Those mm. people represent integrity and skill and work ethic. So you trust them. Mm. They're going to trust other people below or around them. Yeah. So you can go through them to get to equally, if not better, people to work with in another domain. It's a great idea. So I know people. Yeah. I know people who might know people. You know people who know people who might know people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that's... But you know, that solves some problems right here. Right. <laughs> you're not Google searching. Yeah. You're not having, oh, yeah. Like you're using the power of trust through mm. word of mouth. Mm. Like how I found my coach uh, wasn't a Google search. Yeah. It was me asking another coach who I really trusted and I knew was excellent. And he referred me on. And through that, it's one of the best investments I've made in my adult life mm. so I yeah I think that's that is the the power right there that you've got you've already got connections with people that you you trust so tap into them mm. and they'll they'll direct you yep. yeah there you go. I think I get lost in the like okay I do start searching and then I'm like it's overwhelming yeah and then I'm like there's so many options and I don't want to like waste my time yeah. and my money yeah. and my energy yeah. like because I don't want to start the process with them and go, actually, they're not the right fit. Like, I'd prefer to just go, all right, this is the person I'm going to work with and they're going to, to help me. Absolutely. I mean, it, how we met was that you put yourself on Facebook and then we had a mutual connection. And, but, you know, if you went back, like, you could have done that same principle thinking, mm -hmm. like, all right, yeah. how can I ask people around me? Like, uh, actually, maybe, that's, no, that's not how we met. But, yeah, it's, it's just, I think it's a good I think example. It I think it's Steph. Yeah. Whether she yeah. mentioned, I'm not sure. Either that or I think maybe I, no, I did put up a Facebook thing saying I'm looking for someone to help me with, um, maybe it was filming content or Facebook marketing or something like that. Uh, you value independence. Yeah. That's a thing that you associate with your identity. Yeah. Right. You're an independent woman. I also value independence greatly. Uh, for whatever reasons that we don't have to psychologically dissect okay, right now. Right. We can if we want. It's not about me. It's about you, Amelia. <laughs> but you want to control the variables. When you, you, you got, if you're a person who's independent, you want to be in control. You want to be able to do, you want to feel like you're capable and do things on your own. Um, But you need to, at some point, you need to relinquish some of that control, the feeling of control. Mm. And realize that you don't need to do it all. Mm. And that there are other people who are better at things than you, that you can rely on to get to where you're going faster and more effectively and efficiently. Mm. There, I think there's 100% that, what you just said. And then there's the other part of, working out like how much do I invest in something when I feel like okay I'm sitting here but if I invest this much like and it, I think it comes down to like sometimes you know the the difference between the lack mind mindset or the abundance mindset can I afford to do that now when my income is here but then the flip side of that is if I go and invest here then I'm going to generate income yes. business all of that so it's that that's what it, yeah that's what an investment is right it's like you're putting an upfront uh in cost uh value something you value in exchange for a future prosperity mm. but that's a risk yeah because as you say future not now yeah when you put the coin in the machine 
you don't know if you're going to get all four watermelons. <laughs> you might have to spin it a couple times in that down, 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 you know, if you're gambling. <laughs> um, but you can cap the... Tim Ferriss is really great at this in Tools of Titans, but you, there's ways to cap the downsides, right? In terms of like... The risks. The risks, as in... I'm only going to invest this much or I'm going to go with these people because of like their success rates. Right. Or... Yes. And then it's like a, a great tool is like, well, if what, if you're going to buy something, invest in something, can you afford to buy it twice? Mm. Most people can't afford to buy, if they buy a car, most yeah, people yeah. can't afford to buy that twice. Yeah. So and maybe not the best investment then. Yeah. I think another thing is our cost of living is most of most people is quite high. And if you, most people don't record their income and expenses, every dollar that comes in and out. If you just do that thing, just that management task in of itself, you are gonna gain a lot more control over your decision-making and freedom to do things. Mm. And then you can see an audit like I categorize all my income and expenses and I can see exactly where everything's going. And that gives me, and I record my nutrition in the same way. People think it's like, oh, you're so structured and, and routine and regimented. <laughs> but for someone that is actually freedom, like a certain person, like for me, for me, it's a bit too much. But for someone else, like that can feel like freedom because you're like, it's all, it's all there. Like I can see it. Exactly. So mm. that's, that's exactly where I was going. It's very like uh, perceptive of you because now I'm free to make easier decisions. I don't need mm. to think as much. I don't need to worry as much. I know what I can budget with my food mm. and with my money. Mm. And then decisions are easier. Yeah, and I, look, I think I'm someone who probably naturally resists some structure because I do like, you know, probably part of why I've landed as a yoga teacher. I do like the freedom. I do like the, it's not like a nine to five job. It's, there isn't like the sort of regimented, this is what I do every day. Every day looks quite different. And I think there's part of me that really likes that. But I think even within that, there is still some structure of like, this is what my like weekly schedule looks like. And I think when there is, the continuity of still some structure within like an unstructured um, schedule that that works. And so there's part of me that resists that sort of like hard structure. But I think when it is there, it does give me the freedom to know like, okay, well, when that structure is there, I do have this kind of like gap in the middle of the day. That's like my yoga time or my training time. And, and that gives me that freedom and flexibility. The same thing would be with money, if I had everything kind of sort of nutted out, then cool, I do have two grand to go spend on a, a business coach or something. I mean, you're concerned about that now, right? You're like, ah, yeah. oh, I don't know if it's worth the investment. How do you even know mm. if you don't know your profit margins? Like yeah. you might be in a much mm. better situation than you think, or so then you know how much you can afford to invest mm. to get you to further along the path you want. And the structure thing, I get, like people, like. Uh, I get it, but I don't get it because I'm not in your, in your head. Mm. But you can stop at any time. You're in control. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't work for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah no bueno. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> I think like there's obviously different levels and layers of structure, but I think some level of structure can be really helpful. It's like our body responds well to like consistent rhythms. Mm. Uh, we do respond well if there is certain times that we're used to waking up or certain times we're used to eating or moving or whatever. And I think the same is with, you know, how we live our lives. Some people like it down to the T and I, I definitely know for me, it, it doesn't need to be like that structured, but I think definitely having the structure in there does allow you to like see things more, more clearly. So yeah. there is the cool, I know that there is this money that's put aside for professional development or this money that is put aside for my business development or yeah because finances is something that maybe it's taboo for some people and it's also like people get very hung up and like there's a lot of stigmas and stereotypes and emotional attachment 
to that word, that realm, that, that, that world. And I've grown up in uh, an environment that have had more of a famine mentality in that aspect where didn't have much money growing up, you know, mm. just you, we go and if we go, if we go out to eat, we're you crazy. You're going to order more than one thing. Mm. No, we don't get entrees. Mm. And I recognize at the same time that just even going out for some people yeah. is like, that's not going to happen. So yeah. I, I recognize that's even a luxury. Yeah. Uh, but I think recognizing the programming of like, okay, how did you get here to associate structure in a negative way and how did i get to the point to associate money with like famine and then how do i reprogram my brain so i can live a life more on my terms and live a mm. life of oh, that's more free mm. i i look i agree i feel like this conversation has made me want to seek out more help get a little more structure I feel like there was something else that was like a nugget that was like, yes, the answer is right there. Mm. S- seeking other people. Did you say it already? Seeking, yeah, yeah, it's like trusting s- people to yeah. give you resources. Yeah, and people. so seeking out help and yeah, reaching out to my community, having a bit more structure. And then I feel like there was something else you that can, might you come can, back. To- you can watch it back. Yeah, I we, can. We got I, it all. Yeah, yeah. That's the beautiful. <laughs> that's that's what made me want to partly do this because mm. I was having so many like really amazing conversations with people, and I would forget things. Like, and what I, did you say? Right, and I'm like, th- there's. I'm of the belief that every person has something pro- can have something profound to teach mm. and to demonstrate through their the way they communicate through the lessons to their life experiences. And so that's what birthed partly would birth this. Mm. Like I kind of wish the camera was invisible because again, some people can get in their head about it, but yeah. it's, it's just a, it's a tool to document, document the exchange of ideas and energy. And, <sighs> and if it helps someone that's watching or inspires yeah. someone, then great. Yeah. But you know what, do you know what people that's, I'll be selfish. Like, it's not why I started these. <laughs> people say it's like, I couldn't have done. You see, you hear people like in society, like who have like quote unquote made it, could be successful. I mean, I couldn't have, I do this for you guys. I do this for my fans or whatever they say. <laughs> and I think about that and I'm like, you didn't start because of that. Because mm. you had no, no one at the beginning. Yeah. So do you really do it for them? Or is that just like something we power it and repeat because... I don't know, we feel indebted, we feel in servitude, gratitude to, to, to kind of just make people feel a bit special. But I don't know if I buy that a lot of the time. What about the idea, like, for example, I'm, like you said, you've had a lot of great conversations. I'm sure you've walked away from a lot of great conversations and been like, oh, wow, that's really helpful or that's changed my view on this or mm. I'm going to go and seek this out yeah. or I'm going to look into this more or that's affirmed something that I'm doing or whatever it is. And so you've seen, okay, that's been helpful for you or really even just interesting. Um, do, is there a part of you that then go, then thinks maybe someone else would also find this interesting or totally. someone else that might find this helpful or someone else that Absolutely. might find, yeah. But it's not the, f- I don't try and allow it to be the forefront of my mind because then I think I'll start thinking too much about trying to make it something. Like trying to make it for someone else rather than just yeah. like let it be organic and... Yeah. Like yeah. I'll try and like, I'll be less myself. I'll be less authentic. Like I really try and practice. This is going to sound weird, but being me. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I 100% get that because the, fee- the feedback I got when I was a new yoga teacher was you need to be more yourself. Uh. because like I was a new yoga teacher I put my yoga teacher hat on and I was like this is how like as in like I was teaching as a yoga teacher but it was very like one dimensional like you didn't get to see my personality or like want to make it fun or playful or like there was like this is how I teach a yoga class the yoga class could have been great but it, it wasn't like with any of like my flavor in it let's say it wasn't like 
could you work out Amelia's personality by doing that class? So essentially the feedback was like, you need to practice like taking off your teacher hat so yeah. you can like let some of you in the class. Yeah. Like you can like just maybe be a bit more relaxed with how you say this rather than do it in such like a technical or teacher way. So I totally get it. It's like you could be Alex, I call you Alex, Alexander. Um, like this is how you do this, but is that you in your most um, relaxed state or your most you, you I don't know like I I get it as in like if you were to go and be like teach a hat on I'm going to teach you how to do this is that you all the time is mm. that like how you are all the time so maybe there's that moment of like putting that on I'm going to teach you something and educate you but then I also want to like you know be a bit light-hearted or I want to be a bit um say something inappropriate or or whatever it is so that there's like oh that's you as well yeah and and with this here, like we're just talking. So uh, like totally. I want to be like, I want to make sure I try and remove the filters. I've had many conversations with you, and I, this is how the conversations are. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that's awesome. <laughs> because I'm t- <laughs> like that's when if people would ask me, like if someone ask you, yeah, in like ten years from now, like. Is he like that? My answer would in be In person? Yes. On the camera? Like, is they the same? I, I would want, I would hope. Yeah. I was exemplifying something that was consistent. Recognizing at the same time that you're a different person when you're in different environments, but there is a somewhat a consistency of your character. And I, I just, because it, um, what, Another thing that drives me to get here is that I'd listen to interviews of people and I'd hear the interviewer and I get like frustrated because there are, I can, you know, people who do it really well, who are like, they understand the art of communication and pausing and like reading body language. And it's a beautiful dance. Like, I think that's what conversation is. And I listen to people being interviewed. And I would like, parts of me would feel ugh, cringe. Ugh. <laughs> it's like, you didn't even listen. Yeah, you just you are to waiting talk. to talk. Mm. You are trying to get the questions out. And so a part of me is like, there is a, there's a space. There is a need. There's something I crave for in like honest, pure conversations. And when I, when you start, yeah, you are amalgamation of your influences. Like when you started teaching, I'm sure you were like, yeah, you're not yourself. I, I literally had moments where I was like, I'm a little bit like Tiffany Crookshank yep. at the moment. I'm a little bit like Megan Curry. And yep. then I tested out Dylan Werner and uh-huh. I literally was like trying, I tried on different hats of like how totally. I was as a teacher. And eventually I think it was like six months or 12 months in, I was like, this is what my teacher meant. Cause I finally started having fun. Because I was like, oh, I get to be myself. <laughs> no, but like, no shit. That's what, yeah. it, that's what it felt like. It was like, oh, I can like relax. It, like before it was like, I have to be a teacher and this is how I have to teach. And then, yeah, and I still have moments in, in certain scenarios where I'm like, oh, just relax and in, enjoy it. But there's, there's more of that now. It's like I you know, can be myself, whereas at the start I definitely had like, a teacher had on and this was almost like this was a persona and then eventually I was like oh like I can be teacher Amelia but also be myself at the same time right she can she can exist within that yeah yeah and be it authentically yeah because I also want to step out of the room and people feel like they have a connection to me after the class because they've also felt some of that in the class and not being like, oh, she speaks like this in class and then she gets out of the class and she's like, oh, whatever, I don't know. Mm. Um, And if I think about some of my favorite teachers, I get to see some of their quirks in their class or I get to see some of their personality in class or I get to see some of their nerdiness in class or, or whatever it is because they're teaching as them like authentically uniquely them so when you speak to them after class it's the same person right 
On the flip side, I think, which is what you're getting at is like when it feels like they were this person in class and then they were this person after class or this person on the podcast, but actually they're, they're not, they're, like what they're presenting over like here is like a very different version or they're putting on a certain maybe facade or yeah, well, at least that's been my experience as like, I, I, I resonate more so with teachers that I, I feel their authenticity. And that's also what I hope is that I'm being my truest authentic self as a teacher, but also just in life. And I think it's hard to do that for some people. And I think you get better with the time, of course, but like it's hard to do because it, to be comfortable within yourself is a difficult thing because it might sound strange, but it can be really hard to be a person, to be a human, right? Yeah. Like life can be really hard and uncomfortable. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with who they are. And they, we put on certain images and like even our clothing mm. is, can be like a mask, makeup, mm. the way we do our hair, like uh, my braids and cornrows that I used to have. That, that was a, a version of a mask that mm. I was wearing that mm. I had to remove and like kill. And how do you ultimately get comfortable with that? You just, mm. I think there's like so many different ways. Yeah. Like for so, me, I think I've always resonated with um, like movement and doing things physically. So I saw this transition of myself from when I started yoga to now, and I think it's also a continu continuum, is like when I started yoga, I, I don't think I had a huge amount of self-confidence. And I saw that in like my physical ability, there was, you know, I went in, I remember going into, did Bikram yoga at the start. Oh no, it was, there was Bikram yoga and then there was just regular hot yoga, but there was people like doing, crazy things like ex dancers that I would be in like the, the row in front of me doing like crazy things. And I, what I felt in my own body was like, Oh, I can't do that. So there was like the physical, I like, couldn't do those things. But then there was also the, the mental side of it is like, Oh, I can't do that. So there was like a lack of um, confidence because I wasn't at a certain level. So there was like a physical and mental side of it. And for me, what I noticed is like the more capable I became physically mm. also led to more mental confidence and strength and um, trust in myself and in my body. And this is part of where I fell in love with like doing handstands and stuff like that, because sure that it's a handstand and it can be fun for some people. It can be scary for another people, but it took a lot of, time energy practice to build that physical confidence but then that translated into like a mental confidence and if like feeling like i could trust my body and i had the strength and the courage and all of that and then i could see that translate off the matter out of my practice as well so and I've, I've seen this with students as well like i've seen how like the physical had like manifests as like mental confidence and strength and and trust in yourself so for me that was a big thing of like yeah how they're you know there's not just like our our confidence and our um mental strength but how there is this combination i'm sure you've seen it a lot as a coach as people like improve and progress that maybe their their confidence or their ability to speak in front of people or their ability to communicate what they're thinking and feeling. Um, for me, that was a big correlation between those two things of feeling more comfortable in my skin and then more comfortable in like my own body and then more comfortable like outwardly in the world. And it was certainly a, a process. It was certainly time. Um, I think that's, it's a huge, it's a big answer. I think it's a, that's the, one of the big answers. Like, I think there's like a lot more to it, but yeah, I think. But the, how the psychological can be tapped into via the physical mm. and people associate 
changes that you make physically to your body, whether you're trying to get really lean or whether you're trying to put on a lot of muscle or with, uh, whatever you're, that's two of the most common ones. So that is seen as stereotypically superficial, vapid. But I think people get it messed up because the person you have to become in order to create those changes and make them last is not the same person you are right now. Mm. And so there is a massive uh, shift and transformation in character and behavior in habits and your self-esteem and self-efficacy and confidence and like how you interface with the world around you dramatically shifts how you carry yourself. Mm. You talked about energy at the start of this conversation when someone walks in the room how they're presenting or like how they're communicating is going to like dictate like how you feel back. Mm. You could have, if I use these examples because I think they're quite powerful people, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, he <laughs> yep. walked in the room, yep. Jay-Z walked, Jay-Z's like, you know, 50 Cent, like, uh, like these people walk in the room, they don't say a damn word, but you know that mm. you can feel them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But regardless of their success it's like let's just look at like a strong physical presence how you're carrying yourself speaks volumes but how you can gain the confidence to do that can be tapped in through changing yourself physically mm. and I, I think the part that you said about it's what it takes to get that is is for me what was like the most important part because like day one of starting my yoga practice was just day one if i just went one day and then left and never went back again like nothing not much would have happened but it's that showing up each day when you're not feeling great or you're not feeling very comfortable in your skin or you're not feeling very confident but it's like each time like hey you build a little more physical confidence oh i actually feel better oh wow i can do that oh wow like this feels good. Oh, I'm no longer feel like I have to be at, you know, this is, you know, in a yoga sense, I no longer have to feel like I have to be at the back of the room. Maybe I can be at the front of the room. And mm. these are all just like little subtle yeah. shifts, but they were so much more psychological than physical. Like the physical was in there and it was like led by the physical, but it was a whole lot of like psychological and probably energetic things shifting at the same time. But I, I could, like, I probably didn't even notice it so much at the time, but on reflection, I can see that, like, over that time, my confidence has built as well as mm. things that have shifted in my body, my ability, my um, trust in my body, my physical capabilities, all of those things. As that has evolved, so too has my confidence and a big, mm part of it which you men mentioned is like you have to dedicate time and energy and you have to like like commit to yourself you're, you're almost not almost saying you are saying i'm important so i'm going to like put myself first and i would even i haven't said it in a long while so maybe i'm not i don't view it this way but i would say i'm i can be quite selfish because i'm like i am going to yoga five days a week or i'm going to go move my body every day because this is something that i value and i used to sort of frame it as like i am a bit selfish i might be late to a family thing because i'm like i have to go and do this but i i'm choosing to value putting time and energy into myself which i think was also a big part of building confidence it was saying like i'm important so this, this is a priority, even if it means like I'm late to something or I miss something or whatever it is. I really defend that. I really like, and maybe it's, it's also confirmation bias because I also resonate with that. It's like every person needs boundaries, mm. right? And you're non-negotiables. And that's, for me, that's daily training as well. Like the people around me clearly understand that. And I make that, that clear to them that this is like, I'll kind of die on my own sword in that way. And you kind of to your own detriment, but at the same time, it's like for, for a man or woman to not be walked over you, and to be respected, you also need to define clear boundaries and implement them when you're being challenged. But at the same time, regardless of that, I know 
and I, maybe you know as well that I'm going to be of better service, more engaged, a better human being if I have ticked my non-negotiable boxes and if I've done the things that I have uh, created as boundaries. If mm. I have not, mm. and if I now don't do them to fulfill you, that's a slippery slope of resentment, <laughs> yeah, ill yeah. feeling. And so by clearly communicating and, and doing those non-negotiables, I think you can turn up and be a better person for the rest of the world. Mm. I 100% agree with that. Like you're gonna be in a better mood, your energy is gonna be better, you're gonna feel fulfilled, happier, complete, like, okay, I've done that, I've, I've filled up my cup and now I am gonna be here and present. Mm -hmm. Not like, damn, I didn't get to make it to my training or I didn't get to move my body or I didn't do this and now I don't feel as good, now I feel whatever. Um, so I, I agree. It's like, even if you are a little bit late or you miss something or, or whatever it is, that maybe you, you miss half an hour of it, but then you're more present for the rest of the time yeah. there. I think that's the key. Like one of the greatest gifts we can give each other is presentness. And you might be there, but you're, are you there? Yeah. It's too, like I, you might be physically there, but mentally, psychologically, emotionally, you may not be there. Mm. And so I think you, we can do a better job at being there and present if we know we have done the things that we needed and we agreed to ourselves and committed to ourselves that we said we would do mm. versus not doing them, putting them aside and half the time in your head while you're there, you're in another world because you're kind of eating away at yourself for not doing what you said you wanted to do. 100%. <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely resonate with that. And Have people tried to make you feel guilty for doing those things? Yeah. I feel that. Like I can feel I, that in what you said. I used to live on the peninsula down in Mount Martha and near my old house was these stairs that um, go down to like a small little beach that literally was over the road from where I lived. I think it was like, 236 stairs or something and part of what I used to do when I was younger was run a bit and some days it would be going for like a 5k run it wasn't anything crazy but other days it might be to go and do stair runs do like five stair runs or ten stair runs or whatever it was and so sometimes when I go down to see my family that still live in the peninsula I'm like cool I'm gonna drive down there and I'm gonna drive to the beach I'm gonna do some stair running after sitting in the car for an hour and it might be that that is like my movement for the day or it's just something that I know makes me feel good and I, I want to go do it. Um, and so there's been plenty of times where I will be late because I'm like, I still, I need to go and do these stair runs because this is going to make me feel good. It's going to make me feel more energetic. I'm going to get there and I'm going to like be like more energetic, like ready to engage with the family after that. But there's definitely been times they're like, oh, well, here you are finally getting here. Have you been able to create the space to communicate what we've been talking about? And is there an understanding or some people just don't get it? I think now there's a almost unspoken understanding. Okay. Amelia must have been doing her stair running or, and I now have learned not to take on if someone is like, oh, well, where you can't be late or we're going to start without you or like whatever it is, if there is like a something, I'm like, that's fine. I'll see you when I get there. Or um, if there is any comments or anything that is like, well, don't you think you should, shouldn't have done that or, or whatever it is. Now I'm pretty good at just going, well, this is important to me, so I'm going to do it. I don't want to disrespect you. So if you guys want to start dinner yeah, or you if you... communicate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but now I'm, I'm less impacted by those like other comments or, or different things because I'm like, this is part of my priorities. You have your priorities. You're my family and I love you and respect you. And I'm not going to do things to intentionally disrespect you. But 
this, you know, our schedules look very different and this is part of what I'm going to do because it's important to me and it might mean that I am, you know, running a little late or that I, you know, change the schedule a little. So I've learned to let go of certain things and I think there's also been some acceptance on the other side, which for me feels like a pretty good balance because there is an understanding and I don't feel affected by those things. Maybe like I previously might have been. That sounds like progress. Yeah, definitely. To be conscious that you have to go teach soon. Yes. I'm thinking <laughs> that. Uh, I, we never actually finished the start of the conversation. That was I think, psychic. Yeah. yeah. I want to know the, the moment or that, that experience of like, you didn't tell her much, but she got a lot from you. Yeah, so a couple of things. I first walked in and like started smiling because I, she had a round table set up and she was sitting on one side and I went and sat down on the other side and she had done some sort of tarot card reading. So she had some cards out in front of her and these other little kind of wooden um, things that had some symbols on them. I think they were... Um, what's the numbers called? Is it Roman numerals? The Anyway, some sort of number symbols. Um, and then she had two cards that were facing towards me. So she had the cards over um, in front of her and those sort of symbols. And then there was two cards that were facing me. The two cards said new beginnings and release and renew. <laughs> And for me, I was like, this is exactly what's happening in my life right now. Before you sat down? So when I first walked in the room and sat down, there was already cards laid out in front of her and two cards that were in front of me. Got it. So she had done a meditation beforehand. She said to me at the start, or I saw the cards, but then after I saw the cards, she said, I've done a meditation and um, these are the cards that I've, I've pulled out. And so new beginnings is everything that's going on. I ended a relationship, moved out. I'm about to move to Byron Bay. I've had to, not had to, but I've like, this is my last week of teaching at all the studios I currently teach. I've got a new job to go to up in um, Lennox Head and then the rest I'll figure out when I get there, but it's literally like a new chapter. And then the release and renew this last three months has felt like releasing my last relationship for the last, that was for a year and a half. And so there's been a lot of like purging in different ways, journaling, writing, dancing, crying, going to an energy healer, all of the things which have been really therapeutic, but that's what it has been. It's about like, it's been a lot of clearing and letting go. Mm. Um, and then the second thing that happened is she said, I've got a message from an older woman for you. And she said, this older woman wants to tell you, thank you for being there um, in the hospital with me before I passed away. Even though I was struggling breathing, I felt your presence and it was really helpful. And I really appreciated you being there and I didn't, I didn't experience much pain. I didn't suffer very much. But now I'm with someone I love and I have a beautiful garden. And my nan passed away a couple of months ago and my pop, my grandpa, passed away about seven years ago. But in, once he passed away, she, she wanted to go. She didn't want to be here. Um, and she loved gardening. Gardening was like a big love for her as well as cooking for people and sharing her love for food. But she was often out in the garden doing gardening at all hours of the day. Um, so this message straight away was yeah, from my nan. I knew instantly it was from my nan. I started crying and um, the fact that she said like she felt your presence when she passed away and she was struggling breathing. And that was like the significant symptom that we saw it was like this kind of like struggling breathing, which was hard to hear at the time, but also like hit home exactly who this person was, the, the message from this person, which was my nan. And um, yeah, then she went off to talk about my relationship that I just had and that there was some mistrust and some things that were going on that, yeah, wasn't truthful. And she even used the word cheating, she said, 
it wasn't like physical cheating, but it was it was like cheating. It was emotional cheating. Um, Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I I don't know to what depths, but I discovered a little bit on social media of okay. evidence of that. But who knows to what levels? Um, you know, you only see what you see that's exposed to everyone. Mm. Um, but there was a, a feeling from me, like intuition for the last like five, six months that we were together that something felt like there was something I didn't know about. And I asked him several times um, and he always said that there's nothing for you to worry about, there's nothing going on, et cetera, et cetera. But I had a weird feeling that there was. And so what it taught me was trust your intuition, it's often right. Mm. Um, and then she said that, you know, he has another like three years where he's gonna go in this bit of a loop of um, conditioning from his upbringing and then he'll sort himself out. Um, on the other side of things, she was talking about that moving to Byron was the right decision and even though you, you don't have everything figured out there's going to be all these opportunities for you that land in about eight weeks so she said there's going to be a lot of time out in nature a lot of time surfing and horse riding which I you know I've, I've used to do horse riding when I was younger but I I hadn't planned on horse riding but it yeah it was something that I'm like hmm, interesting maybe I'll end up horse riding um, but she also mentioned some different sort of yoga opportunities that um, are going to present themselves. Um, she mentioned, she's like, something like yoga, bon yoga barn is popping up and yoga barn's in Bali, but she's like, something like that keeps coming up. She, I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud, but I will. But she also said center fit keeps coming up. Um, Chris Hemsworth's um, fitness app. Um, Chris Hemsworth mm. and his partner Elsa Pataki live in Byron and I, look, I had planted that seed in my mind. I'd be like, that would be pretty amazing to be a like resident yoga teacher on their online platform. But anyway, she she said that came up. Um, but she just said to me, like, whatever you agree to, make sure that it aligns with you. Right. And then she said, um, uh, there's going to be something associated with meditation and like running some sort of meditation syllabus, possibly like retreats. Um, and she's like, teacher trainings are definitely something you're supposed to be um, to doing. You're, you're a natural teacher. She also said, I'm going to find my husband. Wow. <laughs> well, that's where you, she lost me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one. Wow, okay. We're going to see. I'll, I'll keep you updated. Please. Yeah. If, please, yeah. I mean, the next conversation we'll have, whether in person, podcast, whatever. I'm gonna ask you yeah, yeah. about some of these things. Yeah. Um, did she know your full name, last name included? No, she knew my first name and she had my phone number because I texted her and my first name. See, um, the, 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 the I've heard stuff like with the grandma stuff, that's the stuff that like, I gotta really think about. Like that's the stuff I don't understand. Yeah. Like what are you doing? Searching through medical records? S essentially she's like, straight away, like I sat down and she's like, I'm getting, uh, yeah, an older woman, she has something she wants to say to you. And it was, it was so real because it was like in that moment as I sat down and straight, like, and only the people that were in the room, like it was very specific that she was like, like struggling, breathing. Obviously, like that is a common, it's probably going to be a common thing if someone's right. passing away. But then the garden's another thing. The garden's another Again, thing. Again, is that common? Yeah. So like, I don't know, but maybe. she, the fact that she was like, you know, your presence was felt, because who knows, like maybe I, I wasn't there when she was struggling breathing. Like Which, I, uh, I might've been there. You could have not been there and yeah. that could have been a, another thing to comment on. Yeah. Um, anyway, I know it's not something every, everyone resonates with, but there was, several things yeah. including like the stuff about my ex um i'm very curious now 
Yeah, I've sent a few people to this lady. I would like, cause going, like, have you sent any skeptical people in? Uh, like as a test? My sister went, she's not skeptical, but I would, uh, no, look, I think she's pretty open-minded. I think I, the, the real test would be someone who's really skeptical. Right, um, healthy skepticism, I'm open yeah, to it. Totally. But like, I wanna come in and be like, I wanna feel it. You know, you, you, you wanna test it as someone who is typically not exposed to those things. Totally, but I think to get the most out of these things, you, you do need to go in like, I'm gonna be open-minded okay, yeah, and sure. be okay. like- I gotta remember that. Yep. Yeah, I'm not gonna go in like this, because yeah. if you go in like this, it might be like, you might not be able to pick up as much from you. Sure. But if you go like, I'm here just to see, right. and, you, and you'll know. That's that's exactly yeah. what I want to do, just to see. Um, man. <laughs> I'm glad we finally did this. I know, finally. It's taken us a while. It's, it's like years I've yeah. been wanting to get you on the podcast. Yeah, so, so thank you. No, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And hopefully next time we do this, it'll be up there. Yeah. Or if you visit here. Come up to Byron Bay, otherwise if I'm back here for sure. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Any last thoughts, comments? Um, I just want to say thank you to you for always like having so much integrity and like the best work ethic. And I think I've said all this to you like right from the start. I really appreciate your like attention to detail. Just everything that you do, I really appreciate because working with people like you or interacting with people like you or talking to people like you you can just you can feel it all in every interaction and that's why these conversations i think are really interesting but also like right from the start when you were yeah helping me with the filming and doing all of that stuff for me i was like i, I think i said this to a few people i was like alex is awesome like he's he's on it he's just like i've told him what I want and what I need and you're just I, I really appreciate people that I can trust that are they're going to put their time and energy and effort and go above and beyond and they're the people that I I want around so thank you for being that person and it also pushing me and inspiring me to be better so thank you no it's it's just doing what I only know how to do. I really appreciate the words and I equally feel inspired by you and your journey and constant pursuit of living life on your own terms. That's, that's the one. That's it. Yeah. Thanks Amelia. Thank you.